Fitness is 20% exercise and 80% nutrition. You can't outrun your fork. <laughs>
in life. You know, I was having a conversation with someone the other day, and they said that the more I chase joy, the less I find it. But the more that I'm engaged in my life fully and completely, the more joy I experience. So we're going to be talking about various things from this book. And um, as we talked about it in our Science of Mind class this morning, you might think that it's all about, you know, health and exercise and diet and things like that. But, ooh, man, it's way more than that. I can't recommend it enough. So today, we're going to talk about the mind-body connection as a part of this growing experience of wellness. For our joy to be present, we, we don't want to chase it. We actually want to provide a life in which joy emerges, a healthy, balanced life supported by a healthy balanced body. Yeah. Well, do you know that having a work-life balance didn't actually come into the, um, into the lexicon of the American culture until over 50% of the women went to work? Before that, Life was balanced because one person was working and one person was caring for family and home. Now we're all trying to do both, aren't we? We're all trying to do everything. And to a certain extent, it feels required um, in our culture today and to build the life that we want. And so we have to find a new way of moving into this mind, into this balanced life, and by really taking a look at this uh, mind-body connection. So the first thing is to look at the effects of stress on our bodies, right? Our life impacts our bodies, and whether, and especially the biggest culprit, stress. All of the ways that it, it fogs our brain, impacts our heart, and um, we don't breathe. Many of us breathe really shallowly, right? We're constantly on the anti-acid and the reflux and all of that stuff um, and the aches and pains in our body that are actually not, quote unquote, from a disease or medical condition, but is actually from the way in which we are engaging in life. We're going to spend a lot of time talking about stress and dealing with it next week. Today, we're going to focus on the, on the other side of it, how much our body affects our life. When our body is out of sorts, when we have toxins in our body, when we're not sleeping, not eating well, when we're not shoring up the vehicle, so to speak, it impacts every area of our emotional, mental, and physical life. Right, it'd be like driving a car for 200,000 miles, never changing the oil, never changing the oil filter, never changing any of the filters, never taking it in to be serviced. Do you see? We don't do that with our cars. And yet it seems as though many of us do this with our bodies. And so wellness is truly a circle body, mind, and spirit circle. And it's not unlike our teaching symbol, spirit, soul, and body. And one of the things that, that is really clear in all of the studies and in the spiritual literature, as well as the psychological literature, as well as the physical literature, and that is that you can enter into the circle any place. We usually talk about entering it from the point of spirit or the point of mind. Other people, they talk about moving, um, entering it from the point of body. How are we eating? How are we sleeping? How are we exercising? How are we engaging in life? And for me, for many, many years, I neglected that. I have neglected that part of my well-being because I figure I'm always doing it from the spiritual point of view. And so then we get to ask ourselves, am I healthy and happy? Or am I unhealthy and stressed? In the last two or three years, well, truthfully, in the last 30 years of ministry, there's been more than once when I've laid my physical well-being on the altar of my ministry. 
Why? Because my ministry is important to me. How many of us have neglected ourselves because of our children, our family, our work, our accomplishments, our schooling, the things that we feel as though need to be done out in, out in the world? <clears throat> it is crystal clear to me that I am run by my responsibility and my belief that what I do is the value that I bring. So I better get busy doing, 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 doing. Doing, 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 right? And so these are the kinds of things that we get to examine. So when we think about wellness, <laughs> these are the things that I've been examining, and I invite you to think about it for yourself. We have to examine the choices that we're making. Wellness is a decision, right? It's a choice, it's a decision. The choices that we're making, the beliefs that are running underneath those choices, what's causing us to do that, to, to continually make those choices. And ultimately, we have to examine our excuses because we are very good at rationalizing. Okay, I won't say we. Maybe none of you do this. I can rationalize anything. Just give me two minutes and I'll think about it. Right? And my excuse will come out very cleverly disguised as reasoned thinking. <laughs> right? Yeah. And so if we're going to really um, practice wellness and really look at this circle, do you see choices, belief, and excuses are how we engage in this wheel of wellness and begin to really take a look at it. So... So if our vehicle needs to be healthy so that our joy can expand, so that we have a place to live in and let that joy grow, we really do have to look at two very simple things. One is what we put into our mouths, and the other is how we move our bodies. So this is one of the most startling facts that I learned a while ago that if you want to be healthy physically, only 20% of it has to do with exercise. 80% of it, 80% of it has to do with what you eat. Not your diet like in, oh, I'm going on a diet, but the, the diet of food that, that, that we eat. Actually, I heard the other day about a study that said they could predict people's overweight they could predict it by, and they never saw the person, they didn't know anything about the person or the family. They simply went, went in and they, they looked at the kitchen. They looked at the type of food that was there. Most importantly, they looked at what was on the counter of the kitchen. And they discovered that if there was, they could predict that if there was cereal, breakfast cereal out on the counter or any kind of chips out on the counter, the person who lived in that house was a minimum of 20 pounds overweight. And they never, they, I mean, they, they never had to see that person. They could simply predict it by the food that they saw just on the counters. Yeah. So why do we put into our mouths what we put into our mouths? Why do we eat what we eat? Why do we make the choices that we make? I loved this when I found this. Fitness is 20% exercise and 80% nutrition. You can't outrun your fork. <laughs> Isn't that great? You can't outrun your fork. Oh, it doesn't matter. I'm gonna have this dessert. I'm gonna have this thing. I'm just gonna go run it off in the morning, right? but you can't actually outrun it. You can't outrun your fork. First, it has to be what is in our bodies. So, so <clears throat> yes, I, I want to be very clear, of course, right? I am not speaking from mastery. I am speaking from my own personal <laughs> quest and challenge. So I've been seriously practicing this and working with this for the last seven years. Seven years it occurred to me. I do not live a balanced life. 
my stress level is too high, my physical uh, body is not well in, in the way that I would like it to be well, and I, and I can't experience the joy of ministry as I would like to. Yeah, there's something that needs to be done. So the very first thing, my first win was three, four years ago, five years ago, I began to pay attention to the amount of food I ate and when I ate it. Very simple. I started splitting meals when I went out to eat. Have you, have you seen those plates that when you go out to eat, how much food that is? Holy mackerel! And I am happy to say I can eat the entire thing <laughs> without any trouble. So I simply started splitting it. The other thing that I discovered was, so I had this habit of potato chips at 10.30 or 11 o'clock at night. Yummy, yummy, yummy. And I learned that the reason that I'm eating potato chips, or I was eating potato chips at 11.30, 11 o'clock at night, was because I was creating a false sleeping pill that eating the carbohydrates at that time of night would give me a nice boost to get ready for bed, and then I would have the classic carbohydrate uh, crash so I could sleep. So I was medicating myself with potato chips. Learning not to eat at that point, do you see, then our bodies learn to actually go to sleep as opposed to finding something that allows us or causes us to sleep at night. So that was my first win. I started eating moderately, and I stopped eating potato chips at 10.30 at night. Actually, I stopped buying them. The only way I don't eat potato chips is to not have them in my house. <laughs> Period. End of sentence, right? So my second win was two and a half years later when I discovered once again my mother was right. I hate that. Once again, my mother was right. When I first learned how to shop, she said to me, Petra, if you want to save money and be healthy, shop around the outside of the grocery store. How many of you remember this? right? And why? Because it's all real food. Produce, eggs, meat, cheese, right? It's all real food. You have to, if you're going to buy something that's not real food, you have to go up and down the aisles. And literally, that was the single biggest thing she taught me about shopping. Shop in the aisles as little as possible. And three or four years ago, I thought, oh man, I'm not doing what my mother told me. I was driving up and down those aisles, finding all kinds of things that I wanted to take home. So I stopped doing that. I simply, as much as possible, now of course there's some things you have to go down the aisle, I have to get my coffee, I have to get my pickles, these are important things, right? And you get to peanut butter. And, but do you see, by releasing processed foods and all of the added ingredients and all of the stuff that's there and going back to eating just ordinary food, like real ordinary food, was a huge win for me. My body began to work better. I completely let go of grains. Do you know why we have the, do you know why we have the food pyramid with the grains at the bottom, as the bottom of the food pyramid? That was developed in the 1930s because people were starving and the government needed to get people to eat bread because it was cheap and they could feed people with bread. That's how that pyramid was developed, to show us how important bread was and grain was so that people didn't starve to death during the Depression. It was a great thing. No shame, no blame, right? But now we all believe that we need to eat that much bread and, and, and starches and grains. Do you see how an act like that, a choice like that, becomes a belief? This is what you eat. And finally, a year ago, a year and a half ago, I began to be very obsessed with the amount of sugar that we are intaking in our bodies. Sugar is the single most addictive and toxic substance that there is, more so than heroin, uh, more so than 
any illegal, illicit drug more so than anything else, and it causes enormous impact on our health and well-being. Inflammation, arthritis, diabetes, uh, fatigue, the list goes on and on and on. So a year ago, a year and a half ago, maybe actually a little longer, I, I got on the no sugar, and then I ate sugar, and then I didn't eat sugar, and then I ate sugar, and then I didn't eat sugar, and then I ate sugar. <laughs> But then I didn't eat sugar for a longer period of time, and then I ate sugar. But then, and then I didn't eat sugar for a longer period of time. Do you see? Simply by focusing on it, not beating ourselves up with it, not, oh, I'm a bad person. And you'll notice, I didn't decide to moderate my food, stop eating processed food, stop eating grains, stop eating sugar on January 1st of a, per, of a certain year. This is really important. I think we set ourselves up for failure because we're going to do it all at once right now. Well, Jesus healed the sick and inst had instantaneous raising of the dead. Why can't I just instantaneously stop having all these bad habits? I don't know why, but it doesn't seem to work that way. <laughs> certainly doesn't work that way for me. But here I am seven years later, and my food is healthier than it has ever been before. You see, I spent time examining my choices. Why am I eating this? What do I think it is gaining me? What do I think it's contributing to me? And I examined my beliefs around food and why I eat the things that I eat. And then I looked at all my excuses. Well, you know, I'm on vacation. Oh, come on, it's just a party. Oh, you know, but I'm, t I, I'm tired and I just really want to have that. Are you going to make me not have that? Yes, actually, I am going to make you not have that. That's called being a grown-up, right? Being a grown-up for ourselves. So, so seven years, I, I, I pray that it does not take you so long. <laughs> I believe that I am a slow, sometimes I'm a slow learner, a slow implementer. Seven years later, my food is healthier than it's ever been. And I feel healthier because of it, do you see? And I'm not having the, the sugar crashes, and I'm not having the, all the yo-yoing weight thing. I'm not having any of those things. Examining choices, beliefs, and excuses. Now, why am I telling you this, my story? Because if I can do it, so can you. This is not, I, I'm not special or different. I, it is a process. Wellness is a process. Remember, wellness is a choice and a decision, and wellness is a process. Now, the second piece is the moving. Did you know that sitting is the new smoking? Sitting is the new smoking. Sitting four hours a day is considered um, um, unhealthy, considering uh, sitting six hours a day is, is considered you're actively inviting illness, and considering uh, sitting eight hours a day you are writing your own death certificate. Study after study after study. Sitting is the new smoking. And of course, what do we do? We sit in the car, we sit in front of the computer, we sit in front of our TV, we sit in front of the, you know, the Facebook. We sit and we sit and we sit and we sit. Or should I say, I sit and I sit and I sit and I sit. And I no longer have the excuse of running after my son, right? He's grown and gone. So I don't have that to keep me going. I have even less mastery in this area than I have in the food area. <laughs> so, 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 so this, is, this portion of the talk is provided to you by my aspiration. <laughs> and I hope that you are, inspire, you are aspiring to it as well. And I hope to inspire you to aspire for it. So, what's the answer? Sit less. <laughs> Hello? Sit less. How do you sit less? Well, a few years ago, Karen bought herself a standing desk. Hmm, well, that's an interesting idea. So I bought myself a standing desk. Wow, that's amazing. Now almost our whole staff has standing desks. It's great. So I can stand for a couple of hours, three, four hours, do a project, whatever, that, but I discovered how many meetings I'm sitting in. Pretty soon you're going to have a meeting with me and we're going to have it standing. I'm just saying. <laughs> Sit less. Move more. It's really not rocket science. Everything that I've ever read has said, just move your body. Just 
move your body. Why don't I move? Well, I'm too busy. I'm being responsible. I have emails to answer. I have phone calls to make. I have things to do. I, I have to do ministry. I, I have to be here. I have to serve you. I have to, I have to, I have to. I'm thinking I'm not the only one in the room that has that whole list. I don't have time. And so do you see, we, if we examine our choices, we will see what we believe underneath. The, by examining our choices, we see our beliefs. And, and of course, strength and flexibility. We need, we need to work on both our strength and our flexibility. And so again, as we examine our choices, why do I choose to sit instead of walk? in the morning? Why do I choose not to go to the gym, even though in the last number of years we won't discuss how many gym, how much money I have gifted to the gym population, <laughs> right? I, I, I bought a bike, which was really exciting. I loved, loved, loved the bike. Karen's a big cyclist. We, she, she, we bought me a bike, and I was really excited about it. Do you know how hot it is in Texas? <laughs> It is really hot in Texas. And then there's that whole thing about sweating. Yeah, not so big on sweating. Not so big on the, the having to change clothes all the time. That I find extremely annoying. And, and so, right? So what do we hear? Choices, excuses, and here's the kicker. I've had to look at my own belief. Everybody and everything is more important than I am. Right? That's why we don't have the time. We don't have the time to meditate. We don't have the time to do prayer. We don't have the time to exercise. We don't have the time, whatever it is, because other things are more important. So I've had to look bold-faced, square-eyed, not so much at the belief of whether I love myself or not, I don't, but about whether or not I'm actually as important to me as you are to me or as my work is to me, or my child is to me, or my family is to me, or... Do you see? So when we examine our choices and our excuses, what, what they will reveal to us are the beliefs underneath. And so I began three or four years ago with affirmations. I'm a person who takes care of themselves. That's my first affirmation I've been working on. I'm a person who takes care of themselves, And immediately, immediately in the back of my mind came, oh, well, if you're so important as to take care of yourself, who's going to take care of your work? Can you hear it? Can you hear the judgment? Can you hear the blah, blah, blah about it? Right? So by, by doing this, do you see, we can examine our choices and our beliefs that are behind the things that we say we want to do, that we know actually is for our well-being. And so I'm continuing to construct various affirmations as I work through this process for myself so I can unearth those beliefs and negate the excuses. Do you see? That's what our spiritual work does. It unearths earths the belief, gives us new ones, and it negates the excuses and, and, and helps us make choices, make decisions, and move forward. So, because clearly I do not have mastery in this, I am, oh, I am, an, and so this is part of the law of accountability that he talks in here. And so I want to exercise this law of accountability. I'm inviting you to the healthy living circle. And, and, we, and I need one, so I'm making one. And, <laughs> and I'm hoping you all will come. So, so, yes, thank you. So our healthy living circle is to practice the law of accountability. It is to look at our choices, examine our beliefs, and examine our excuses. We're going to meet the third Wednesday of every month at 5.30 for an hour. We're going to build accountability partners. We're going to find... This is not about shame and blame, nor is it about saying, I'm now going to go to the gym, not have sugar, eat right, become a vegetarian. Right, right. No, we're not setting ourselves up for failure. We are setting ourselves up for long-term success because I've already done it in the food department, so I expect to be able to do it in the healthy body moving department as well. And you all have, health, have hope and strength to share with me, and I have hope and strength to share with you. 
we have lots of hope and strength to share with each other. So we're going to build sustainable and accountable ways to actually live our healthy living circle. Because ultimately, Greg says, our healthy living circle actually is the outpicturing of the law of unity. Body affects the mind, mind affects the spirit, spirit affects the body, body affects the spirit, spirit affects the mind, mind affects the body. Do you see? The law of unity means these are all interwoven and integrated. And so we need a healthy platform. Our physicality is a healthy platform on which we build a healthy life. So next week, we're going to talk about stress, and we're going to talk about mental equivalence. And the last week, Karen will bring it home with gratitude and how to take up our lives in a big way. So I hope you'll go on this walk with us, um, and please do um, dive into the book, Come to the Healthy Living Circle. <laughs> and you know what? You deserve all the joy of life. So let us close with prayer. Grateful for this opportunity to be together, grateful for the joy that is in our hearts, grateful for that which we have to share, grateful for the good. We simply let it be, and so it is.